The West Indies was the graveyard of the British Army in the late 18th century. Death by diseases such as yellow fever almost wiped out an entire generation of soldiers. But the campaigns waged should not only be remembered for sickness and death. Today I'm joined by author Steve Brown to learn all about the Special Forces style mission that saw Martinique captured from the French in 1794 a little remembered but important campaign of the French Revolutionary Wars. The commander of that British expeditionary force was Lieutenant General Sir Charles Grey, a complex man but a man whose management of this campaign deserves a lot more appreciation according to Steve. Stay tuned until the end of the video for his assessment. If you enjoy this film guys then please do like and subscribe for many more like it. You can also download the full 90 minute interview with Steve via the Redcoat History podcast. Steve has written a book about this campaign called By Fire and Bayonet. That book can be ordered from helion.co.uk. His expeditionary force left Barbados at the start of February in three divisions. And really, bits of this campaign, some of the stuff that are reasonable, like commando raids and SAS expeditions rather than traditional continental warfare of the 18th century. He landed his three brigades um, on Martinique. Two of them landed more or less simultaneously. Gray and Brigadier General White landed at the south of the island and then really, I guess, yomped overland to try and capture a, an island called Pigeon Island, which uh, overlooked the main bay and, uh, and the the main bay in Martinique was considered the premier anchorage of the entire that part of the West Indies. It was a seriously uh, desirable anchorage for ships and they wanted to capture Pige Pigeon Island which was the uh, a fortress with big guns overlooking Fort Royal Bay so they really wanted to capture that. At about the same time and well on the same morning uh, Sir Thomas Dundas landed on the east coast uh, at a place called Trinité with his light brigade and um, attempts to capture that town and also move inland and capture the, the heights in the centre of the island overlooking the main the main town. Uh, well, a place that was called Fort Royal back in the Bourbon days and then the, the Republicans changed it to Re Republicville <coughs> because the, the names of the towns in these West Indian islands were constantly changing. Uh, you know, the Bourbons would give it a Bourbon name and then the Republicans would capture it and give it a Republican name and the British would capture it and call it Fort George or Fort, Fort Edwards and the French would capture it back and call it, you know, <laughs> so it went on and on. So it must be confusing for you as a historian covering this era then, trying to cross-reference all these oh, names. Yeah. Absolutely. This is, there's a lot to take in. About, actually, I think it was the late the same day that the... Um, Gray's 3rd Brigade and his weakest brigade under the command of Sir Charles Gordon landed uh, just north of Fort Royal uh, at a place called uh, Castin Navier, which was actually quite close to the capital. He, he only had a short overland uh, march to get there, but it was terrible countryside. It was like super steep cliffs, thick jungle. Um, so he moved incredibly slowly. And that was um, sort of what happened in the first couple of days. Eventually, White managed to capture Pigeon Island and the, and then the Royal Navy sailed into Fort Royal Bay on about the 12th of February. The French, however, still occupied uh, the town itself, which was called Fort Royal or Republicville. There was another fort on the hill, a, a very strong fort actually, called Fort de la Convention or previously Fort Bourbon. And there was a, head, there was a, a mountain range overlooking that called Morne le Brun. Mont Le Bruno. <clears throat> and um, Dundas had managed to capture Mont Le Bruno. So he had he had overlooking rights to the city, but the French were holed up in the city, which is in a, in a very strong fort. And the French garrison was commanded by a quite young French lieutenant general called Nassion Rochambeau, who was the son of one of Lafayette's main men uh, during the American War of Independence. And you know, to all intents and purposes, Rochambeau looked like, you know, this was a, a guy on the up. I mean, this is a guy that was going to be one of Napoleon's marshals, you know. And he acted like it, like he, he once he uh, got his men into um, into Fort de la Convention and uh, 
a very small, to marry for a very small force. He only had like two companies of regulars and an artillery company and a lot of locals. Um, and he then, uh, you know, he, he sat down to say, well, come and get me out because I'm not surrendering. In the meantime, Sir Thomas Dundas over on the East Coast um, had decided to capture a town up on the northwest of the island called Saint-Pierre. Saint-Pierre was effectively the capital of Martinique, even though uh, Fort Real was the, you know, the commercial capital, so to speak, <clears throat> certainly the military capital. So he split his force into two and had them march across um, the north side of the island. The north, the north part of Martinique has five extinct volcanoes. It is all just mountain ranges. So for a day and a half, his troops literally walked up and down mountains to attack a, a French outpost called Mont Rouge up on the north end of the island overlooking Saint-Pierre, which they did. I mean, this is like an SAS operation. This was in stifling heat. The guys are dressed in European uniforms, you know, with thick red coats and shirts and long pants and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Full What's pack. It's probably about, you know, uh, 42 degrees Celsius and 120% humidity. Um, and they marched overnight and, and marched up a mountain range and, and, and captured this thing where Gray took his first serious casualty of the of the campaign. The, a guy called um, Colonel John Campbell commanding the ninth foot. Uh, was picked off by a sniper, but they they easily took the uh, the fort, and um, they were that then able to march to the cliffs overlooking Saint Pierre, and then came down the cliffs uh, in conjunction with a naval assault on Saint Pierre, and captured the commercial capital of Martinique. So the only thing left to capture it by that point was uh, Fort Real and uh, Fort Fort well Republic Ville and Fort de la Convention. With the, with the things left to capture by by then. But <clears throat> this was about um, close to, I think, about 20th of February by this stage. So they're already a couple of weeks into the campaign. Gray really wanted to finish, uh, we really, really wanted to capture Martinique by the end of February to give him time to do St. Lucia and Guadeloupe. <clears throat> and uh, couldn't really afford to spend too much time mucking around in Martinique. He really wanted to capture it. But he hadn't gambled on uh, on Rochambeau. Rochambeau was not a guy to be uh, not a guy to give up easily. Gray had no choice but to go into siege mode. So he had all the Royal Navy men bring all their heavy cannons aboard, uh, or take their take all the heavy cannons from the ships and bring them onto land, and crew them with Royal Navy men, <clears throat> twenty four pounders, eighteen pounders, thirty six pounders, all that kind of stuff set up a ring of steel around um, Fort Royal and Fort Bourbon and um, basically hammered it <laughs> with, uh, I think in the end he had something like 117 um, artillery pieces, something like that. And the, the French just would not, they rejected multiple times, uh, pleased to surrender. The, I mean, the, the Grace Force were turning the place into a ruin, but they, they just would not surrender. And they finally surrendered on the 22nd of March. Now, you may recall a minute ago, I said that Gray wanted to capture Martinique by the end of February. Yeah. So the 22nd of March was... Because uh, he's still got to get all late. his campaigning finished by May. Is that right? We've got two more islands to go, let's not forget. <laughs> so Fort Bourbon was taken and, you know, <clears throat> sure as eggs, it was renamed Fort Edward. The French garrison marched out with colours flying boarded ships and were repatriated from France, uh, with the exception of Rochambeau, who, fearing that the Republicans weren't keen on uh, <clears throat> their generals who failed, <laughs> and I think he thought if he went back to Paris, he would suddenly find himself with a rather large air gap between his chin and his chest. So he um, boarded a British ship and went to Philadelphia. How is your assessment of Grey as a commander? Did he... You, you said he was seen as a pretty decent guy, but a disciplinarian. But tactically, did he show a lot of nous? You know, these these uh, assaults on these different islands, his uh, you know use of the navy and so forth. You know, these are complicated things. Do you think he did, generally did a pretty yep. good job? Yes, yes, I do. He used his flank battalions extremely well because he was, I think, he was a light infantryman at heart, and he'd proven that in North America. His his Dundas's march overland and over mountain ranges to capture Saint Pierre was extraordinary. Uh, it's a pity almost nobody knows about it today. I mean, I, you know, I read uh, um, uh, 
accounts of, you know, like Wellington's retreat from Burgos when they had to, you know, retreat a couple hundred miles in heavy rains and the whole force disintegrated. I'm thinking, holy crap. Um, Gray sent his men in full pack over a mountain range in, you know, extreme humidity and extreme heat, and they did it overnight, and they still captured the town. <laughs> you know, um, I, th I think he did things that uh, perhaps, you know, later commanders didn't even manage to do themselves. Um, in a small campaign that's a little bit on the outer, not very well known, um, and didn't have any huge strategic impact overall because at the Treaty of Amiens in 1802 these islands were handed back to France of course um, and then um, Sir George Beckwith had to recapture them in 1809 and 1810. So there you have it guys a great introduction to a fascinating campaign led by a complex general. What's not to love? Steve will be back on the channel soon to explain how horrific the casualty rates suffered by the British were during this era. You can also listen to his entire interview on the Redcoat History podcast, available via all good podcasting apps. All right, guys, see you soon.